James Rachels was a philosophy professor who spent uh, most of his professional life at the University of Alabama. He wrote a number of books, all of them on ethics in one way or another. He's primarily an ethicist, and he worked primarily in applied ethics. What we're going to be looking at today is a chapter from one of his uh, books on cultural relativism. Uh, Rachels is a critic of cultural relativism. He thinks it's false. And so we're going to start looking at, uh, we're going to start considering his reasons for uh, criticizing cultural relativism here in this video. We'll not continue it in the next. Rachel's begins by considering the argument that cultural relativists tend to give for cultural relativism. He calls this argument the cultural differences argument. So the cultural differences argument is the argument that cultural relativists tend to give. Rachel's is going to criticize the cultural differences argument. He doesn't think it works. Um, it's easy to kind of get lost in this dialectic because he's putting forward this argument. He calls it the cultural differences argument. It's easy to think that this is what Rachel's thinks, that this is Rachel's own argument. It's not. It's the argument of people like Benedict, which Rachel's is then going to critique. All right, so how does this cultural difference, differences argument go? <clears throat> it starts off with the claim according to Rachel's, this is Rachel's reconstruction of this argument. And in Rachel's view, this is the most common argument advanced in favor of cultural relativism. And I think it's fair to say you find something like this argument in the Ruth Benedict article that we uh, looked at. <clears throat> So this argument starts off with the claim that different cultures have different moral codes. And indeed, we saw uh, Ruth Benedict claiming something like this. Indeed, she spent most of her time establishing this claim. So she gave us all kinds of examples uh, to support this claim. She told us about the Kwakiutl and how they handled death of loved ones and how they passed the grief on instead of grieving themselves and so on. She told us about the Melanesians who, um, you know, are very mean and dis distrustful toward their neighbors. Uh, and on and on. She told us about other examples too. Cultural relativists tend to focus on this premise. They tend to spend most of their time, this is Rachel's view, and I think this is true of Benedict, they they tend to spend most of their time, most of their intellectual energies, establishing this. Now, in Rachel's view, <clears throat> cultural relativists, having established this premise, they then conclude from this premise alone that there is no objective truth in morality, that morality is relative to culture, that cultural relativism is true. So it's straight away from that claim that different cultures have different moral codes, straight away from that claim, cultural relativists conclude that there is no objective truth in morality. And this seems to be a fairly straightforward, or you might even call it a literal reading of what we found in Benedict. When we were reading Benedict, we saw her go through this, um, this series of examples. And then we, found, we saw that paragraph that I uh, quoted for you, where she talks about how it's morally good is synonymous with uh, socially approved or it is habitual or whatever, however exactly she puts it. And so it seems like the, the movement of Benedict's thought was, well, look, we have all these different uh, moral codes in different cultures. Morality is relative to culture. There is no objective transcultural code of morality, right? That seems to capture fairly well the way that uh, Benedict's article uh, progressed. So what's Rachel's is criticism. So this is the cultural differences argument. This is the argument that cultural relativists tend to use to support cultural relativism. What does Rachel's find objectionable, uh, objectionable about it? His criticism is that this argument is invalid. Invalid in this context, when we're analyzing arguments in uh, philosophy. Invalid means something very specific. It doesn't just mean it's no good. It doesn't just mean, ah, I don't really, it means something very specific. It means that the conclusion 
does not logically follow from the premises. An argument is invalid if the premises could be true, but the conclusion false. An argument is invalid if the premises don't entail, logically entail the conclusion. <clears throat> And that's what's going on in this argument. To see this, consider the logical form of the cultural differences argument. And so to consider the logic behind the argument, the logical form of the argument, what we need to do is abstract away from the specific content of the argument. And philosophers do this by plugging in variables for the specific propositional content of claims and arguments. So instead of saying something like different cultures have different moral codes, well, that's just a claim. That's just a proposition. Let's just put the letter P to stand for that proposition or any proposition. It's just a claim, right? The cultural differences argument proceeds from that claim, from a claim, to another claim, there is no objective truth in morality, right? So from P, we would conclude Q. Q is just a variable or a placeholder for some other claim. And so the logical structure of the argument is P, some claim, therefore Q, some other claim. And what Rachel's notes is that that's invalid. That's not a good, uh, valid, logical form. You can't logically conclude Q just from P. And to see why, consider an argument that has the same exact logical form. We're going to consider an argument that's obviously absurd. And what it shows is that this logical form doesn't work. <clears throat> So here's a claim. We'll substitute this in for P. I ate berry berry kicks this morning. And from that claim, we're going to conclude with Q, just some other random claim. Sparta defeated Athens in the Peloponnesian War. That argument with the same logical form down there in the lower right, it's got the same logical form as the cultural differences argument. The argument down in the lower right is obviously absurd. Obviously, the premise has nothing to do with the conclusion and doesn't support the conclusion in any way whatsoever. Certainly, logically doesn't support the conclusion. <clears throat> That's, and so, right, since the logic is the same in all of those arguments that I have up there and the cultural differences argument and the argument in the lower right, right corner, right, the logic of the cultural differences argument doesn't work. The premise could be true and the conclusion false. Just as it could be true that I ate Barry Barry kicks this morning, but nonetheless false that Sparta defeated Athens in the Peloponnesian War. In fact, it's true that Sparta defeated them, and it's false actually that I ate Barry Barry kicks, but so it goes. Kids ate it. So the logic behind the argument doesn't work. That's what Rachel's claim is. Now, as far as it goes, Rachel's criticism is uh, correct. But in my own view, I think it's a little unfair. It's a little unfair to cultural relativism and a little unfair to uh, Benedict. Though that does capture pretty well exactly how Benedict proceeds in her, ar in her article, <clears throat> it's pretty clear that there is just a, a premise in the argument that has gone unstated. There's a premise in the cultural, difference, uh, cultural differences argument that Benedict simply hasn't stated. In general, if you can interpret somebody's argument such that it's valid, you should do so. Uh, kind of being fair to it requires that you do so. So maybe that means supplying it with a premise that's not stated by the person writing the article or the argument, but nonetheless supplying it for them. So let's try that in this case, right? And so the way to see how this works, let's consider the logical form of the argument. P, therefore Q, that's invalid. P doesn't imply Q. There's no link there. Well, we could really easily make it valid. All we need to do, create a little space there and put in a premise that connects P and Q. And this will do the trick. 
if P, then Q. That argument form, valid. That is logically valid. If those premises are true, substitute in anything you like for P and Q. If those premises are true, the conclusion is true. Those premises logically entail the conclusion in a way that that, P therefore Q, does not, right? That logically entails the conclusion. P, if P, then Q, Q. <clears throat> so now the logic of the argument will work. Well, all we had to do to make it work was supply uh, a connecting premise, an if-then premise, yeah? Well, maybe we should do the same thing for the cultural differences argument. Sure, Benedict never states such a premise, but, I mean, you can't spell out every detail all the time. And, you know, you might think you're being a little obsessive if you require every detail always to be spelled out in every context, right? And so, yeah, maybe Benedict just didn't uh, state this premise, and that's fine. People do that all the time. Let's, supp uh, let's uh, supply the premise for her. And so the premise would have to link that claim number one with claim number two, right? The, the premise number one with the conclusion number two. Here's what will do that. If different cultures have different moral codes, well, then there is no objective truth in morality. That argument now, if we understand the cultural differences argument to be claiming something like that, that is valid. The logic of that argument is airtight. Logically valid. Okay. <coughs> that doesn't mean it's a good argument, though. It means the logic works, but there are plenty of arguments where the logic works, where the argument is nonetheless terrible. For example, let's say we tr that uh, argument that was down in the lower right corner about eating kicks and whatever. Let's say, if, let's say we add a connecting premise to that argument. So we have premise one, I ate berry berry kicks this morning. Premise two, if I ate berry berry kicks this morning, well then Sparta defeated Athens in the Peloponnesian War. Therefore, Sparta defeated Athens. That argument is logically valid. The logic in that argument, airtight. Absolutely no problem at all as perfect logic. No problems there. Nonetheless, that's a terrible argument. And it's a terrible argument because that connecting premise, that if-then premise, is absolutely false. There is absolutely no link between what I ate for breakfast and whether or not Sparta defeated Athens. Yeah? That if-then claim is clearly false, obviously false, right? And so that argument is no good. It's a bad argument, even though it's logically valid. And so now we have to consider the cultural differences argument in that light. So we have a logically valid argument now, but is it any good? And I think there's a similar problem as we just saw in that kicks Athens sparta argument. The connecting premise, is it true? It doesn't look like this connecting premise, claim number three, is true. The claim that if different cultures have different moral codes, well, then there is no objective truth in morality. Why think that that's true? Why should the mere fact of disagreement entail that there is no objective truth? In every other domain, we don't think that, right? We countenance disagreement in every other domain, and we don't straight away conclude or think that that implies that there's no objective truth. For example, different cultures have different views of why objects fall to the ground. So if we were to go back in a time machine or whatever and go talk to Aristotle and the Greeks or whoever, you know, people around that time, ancient Greece, and we ask them, why do, uh, why do objects fall to the ground? I pick up a rock and it falls to the ground. Why does that happen? <clears throat> they would say, because the natural resting place of the rock, I mean, it's a little bit more complicated than this, but uh, they would say, the natural resting place of the rock is at the center of the universe. And the center of the universe, in their view, was the center of the earth. And so the rock's trying to get there because that's its natural goal. That's its natural place. It's just trying to get back home. When you lift it up, you're taking it farther away from its home. It's trying to get back home. So you move your hand and it falls and it's trying to get back home. Yeah. But then there's all this other dirt in the way. And so it can't quite get all the way there. That would be what they would say. 
what would we say? Well, we'd say, uh, no, that's not how it works. The earth is a massive object, as are you, as is the rock. And massive objects exert gravity on each other. And the earth is a really massive object. And so it exerts a lot of gravity. And so, yeah, when you pick something up away from it, it's going to fall back down to it. Gravity very different answer than what Aristotle gives. And there are uh, civilizations, cultures today, that haven't been touched by, uh, haven't had much contact with um, uh, the rest of the world. And uh, I'm pretty sure, I'd, I'd say I'd go out on a limb and say I'm 100% sure that if we did make contact with these cultures and asked and, you know, picked up a rock in front of them and then dropped and say, hey, why'd that happen? What, what do you guys think? Uh, I'm 100% sure that they would not tell us well because F equals G times M1, M2 over R squared, as we all know. And the, they, they wouldn't give us the gravity answer. Maybe they wouldn't have an answer. Who knows what their answer would be? I don't know. Um, but it's not going to be gravity. It's going to be something else. And so what do we have here? We have different cultures with different views about why objects fall to the earth. We say gravity, the Greeks say this stuff about natural place, um, this culture uh, that's kind of been untouched by the rest of the world, hasn't made contact with the rest of the world. They say some third thing. Are we to conclude that while there's no objective truth as to why objects fall? No, that'd be absurd, right? Just because different cultures disagree that doesn't mean there's no objective truth. That doesn't mean that one culture hasn't hit upon the truth right? I think what we'd want to say is that our answer about gravity is like a million times better than the Aristotelian one about natural place. And we have all kinds of things that we can explain with our account that they can't explain. And there's all kinds of arguments we could give for why our answer is superior. Why it's better? Why it's truer? Why it's the truth? <clears throat> the mere fact of disagreement doesn't entail that there is no objective truth. And you could just run a million examples like this. Um, I don't know. Maybe this uh, culture untouched by the rest of the world uh, or has made contact with the rest of the world. Maybe they think the world is a uh, hexagon, a hex, uh, hexagonal prism, hexazoid. I don't know what they're called. Hexazoid? I don't know. Uh, maybe that's what they think the shape of the world is. Probably not, but I don't know. Just for the sake of illustration, let's say they do. Okay, they think the shape of the world is that. There are certain people running around the United States today who claim the earth is flat, right? Okay, so that's another view. And they got their own little subculture or something, right? So we got these people saying maybe, I don't know, that the earth is a kind of hexagonal prism thing. We have, uh, can you have a hexagonal prism? No, I don't know. I don't know. Um, we got uh, uh, flat earthers running around, yeah. And then we have uh, the rest of the people out in uh, the United States, whatever, who have actually, you know, like looked at the earth <laughs> and know that it's a sphere, yeah. So you have three different answers. Is there no objective truth about what shape the earth is because you have different people disagreeing? About no, that's absurd. Clearly the earth is a sphere, even if certain people don't realize that, even if certain people disagree. The mere fact of disagreement doesn't tell that there's no objective truth. Now, yeah, morality and ethics might be different than um, science in certain important ways. It's less different than I think most people think, but it's going to be different in certain ways, right? Because with science, we have experiments and observation and so on. And there's, but not with all science, actually, if you get into it. Um, and that's not, and there's, it's a kind of caricature of science to think that it always proceeds in that way. But put that to the side. There might be certain dissimilarities between science and ethics. Fine. But uh, no, uh, why think that w there might be disagree, there might be differences, but it doesn't seem like they would entail that, well, if you have disagreement in ethics, that means there's no objective truth, right? That, there's nothing about the differences between science and ethics that would entail that. Right? So the mere fact that you have disagreement in ethics is no reason for thinking there's no objective truth in morality. Now, what does this mean for the cultural differences argument? It means the argument doesn't work. Fine, we've made it logically valid, but uh, it's kind of been at the expense of introducing a false premise. Now, what does this mean for cultural relativism? It doesn't mean, and Rachel's is clear about this, it doesn't mean that cultural relativism is false. 
It just means that the primary argument that cultural relativists use to support cultural relativism doesn't work. That doesn't mean cultural relativism is false. It means they don't have a good argument for it. It might nonetheless be true. Maybe they just haven't found the good argument for it, right? Rachel's is aware of this. He's aware that all he's done at this point is kind of knock down <clears throat> the argument for cultural relativism. And what follows, Rachel's is going to argue directly against cultural relativism. Rachel's is going to give his own arguments as to why cultural relativism is in fact false. <clears throat>